do would uh, go ahead and get started. I'm uh, Kevin Harris, and I've got pen and paper out here, so that's kind of a clue where it's going to be conversational. That's kind of what we're going to do. I'm going to take notes. I'm going to learn from you all. Hopefully, we get a little bit of uh, discussion about ways that we're using AI and mental health, and maybe ways that we can use it more effectively at our job and in the future. So just stop me anytime. And I just always like to add um, this slide in if I'm talking about mental health, especially if we're doing conversational. Just if it does trigger anything, feel free to get up and walk out if you need to take some time. Um, here's some resources that if you uh, do uh, need just a, any conversation to do come up around anything. And we do have a chat window. Um, so, so when, when um, you know, we're talking about the need for this, I think all of us, you know, personally, and, you know, with family and our colleagues that we work with, understand how important mental health is. And I think we're probably understanding it more um, now. You know, we've probably all kind of thought about our health, you know, and probably five years ago, when we, five, ten years ago, when we would think about health, we were thinking, mostly physical health, you know, and those were, you know, when we talk about accommodation and things that we need, we were talking about physical health. But this is just one statistic that I pulled. There's a lot more that I think the fact that we're here in the room that all of you all recognize how important um, this issue is. But, you know, when we talk about, you know, 6.8 million adults um, in the U.S. alone are looking at major depression, possibly. And so this is you know, um, something that not only should we do, we see a lot of stats that talk about different organizations and how this impacts productivity, but really past productivity, it's the right thing to do. You know, we've got to take care of ourselves. You know, I kind of say that it's the, you know, the airplane analogy, you know, to where you've got to uh, take the mask first and take care of yourself before you look at helping someone else. And so we all have to take care of ourselves in these are some ways that you know we possibly can do it in a different way than we have, and, and not that artificial intelligence should do away with um, you know traditional methods. And I think not just in mental health. A lot of times when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's looked at as a replacement technology or jobs that are going to be lost or people that we're going to replace. Um, and I like to look at it as something that's being added. You know, to our toolkit, not necessarily saying that because we're going to use artificial intelligence, we have to do away with X, Y, Z. You know, if we've got automated driving cars, you know, does that mean that we're never going to drive again? Probably, probably not. I would love to never drive again. It's just not my thing. I think it probably was. I've got a younger sister, and so when I turned 16, I became the chauffeur automatically. So I've never been a fan of driving. But you know, a couple of terms we got mental health and artificial intelligence to just to kind of level set us all is uh, mental health um, includes our emotional, uh, physiological, and social well-being. And sometimes we think about one of those or the other as being more, but we got to think about mental health collectively as all of these things, you know, socially, you know, it's important, you know, um, with our mental health how we handle stress, relate to others, how we make healthy choices. And even if you kind of think about like, I personally, you know, if I'm in a new role or a new job, kind of how I view a supervisor or manager, I, I say that I don't know them well until there's a stressful event that happens. You know, and something, things don't go according to plan, totally off the rails, and how do they treat the team then? You know, is it totally different? Do they maintain the same course or, you know, do things uh, change? And also at every stage of our life. So these are tools that we can use not just in, you know, a lot of times we try to compartmentalize. You know, we'll talk about youth and social media usage. Or we'll talk about, you know, maybe a sandwich generation of being stressed with raising parents and raising kids at the same time. But really it's impacting us, you know, um, no matter where we're at you know, from, you know, cradle to the grave. 
So when we talk about artificial intelligence, and if we all pulled out our phones right now, um, and we talk about what is artificial intelligence, probably, I don't know, 30 of us in here, and we'll probably all come back with different definitions. And so these were just a couple of definitions that I pulled from Microsoft and both my IBM and Google. <clears throat> but just, you know, I think for general use, you know, using technology to make decisions is kind of how we can kind of compartmentalize that and say what we're doing. So here when we're talking about using technology um, to make decisions to hopefully improve our mental health and still being aware that technology and artificial intelligence can have a negative impact on our mental health. And I'll kind of pick on because some of my students say that I rant about social media I don't, I don't say it's a rant, but I'm not a huge fan of social media just because of some of the dangers, misinformation, and addictions of social media, but I'm not someone to say no one should ever use social media. You know, just understanding the risk. I mean, if you're in a marketing career, you're in certain careers, you're gonna have to use it. Um, you know, even, you know, and you know, you share with us your profession of being a chaplain in theology, like now that's a core uh, component of most religious services is uh, social media. You know, we kind of changed some of that with, uh, you know, we were in the heat of the pandemic, you know, and religious institutions that were able to pivot and move services online. Um, I would probably guess that their um, congregations now are probably the same or more than what they were uh, pre-pandemic and not the same for smaller congregations. I know when the church my mother goes to, they never pivoted. Um, they use an old school conference call phone line, and, which was, you know, you can imagine what the experience uh, was there, but they're mostly older uh, congregation. And, you know, I think they lost several, you know, uh, members during that time. <clears throat> So what we normally think about when we think about artificial intelligence are these fields. You know, our smart cities, our smart homes, probably most of us have some type of smart components in our houses. I'll ask this, does anybody not have some type of smart technology in their house? Yeah. So we, we all do, so we've got to understand of how these work together. And sometimes, you know, there are pros and cons to that. I put in a smart thermostat and I was happy I got it installed, everything was working right. But I work from home a lot of times, and so if I wasn't moving around, it would think no one was at home and we'd use our artificial intelligence to try to adjust the temperature. So I had to go in and modify that. But these are, you know, areas that we think that we use in a lot of manufacturing, finance, our digital assistance, logistics. You know, um, military, medical, travel. But we don't think about mental health. Even though one of the first uses of artificial intelligence chatbot was a mental health chatbot in the 60s. You know, so if we think about, you know, where we're at now, granted, what computers were at the time and what processing powers were at the time, you know, it's, you know, totally different than what we're looking at today, but it was recognized that, you know, chatbots and technology can be used to answer questions um, and give responses based off of data that's entered. And so even though this was one of the first instances, this professor ended up being one that um, issued warnings about the potential danger and risk of the technology that he invented, you know, just saying that you want to be aware that artificial intelligence, even in its early phases, um, could have some risk and could give information that's not accurate. But if we kind of think about it, um, you know, we can get inaccurate information personally from each other uh, sitting here, you know, what time's the next session? You know, somebody could say 3.30, somebody could say 4.30. Um, but typically we've got something that we trust to go to, the official schedule that we can go to to look. But if we begin to trust 
information that we get online through artificial intelligence more than um, you know the real world that I call it. Um, that's when just me personally think it becomes more dangerous. And a lot of younger people, not that scanner crowd, we aren't younger, but are getting their information through technology without some of their traditional means that we've been used to getting the information. <clears throat> and so when we talk about how it can be used, um, artificial intelligence technology can be used through um, for mental health, we've got a couple different tools, um, chatbots, you know, and these are just, we're texting or verbally communicating and getting answers back. So, you know, similar to, you know, if we kind of think about it, if we're on that Home Depot and we're looking at Home Depot and we're typing in, you know, um, you know I'm looking for the appropriate amount of wood to put together a porch. Um, that's what we're talking about with chatbot. And depending on how accurately, you know, it's developed, this gives us an opportunity to engage maybe in an environment that we couldn't engage verbally even because of privacy. Maybe we're in shared quarters, we want to reach out to someone for assistance um, that's there. Um, mental health apps, and we've got a couple that we'll take a look at there, but range from being an app that can maybe be used by metrics, um, give us warnings about things that may happen, um, that maybe give us suggestions that we're able to use some of the app through the predictive model. So, you know, how do we look, how are we engaging? Um, you know, I know I get the notifications every week that tells me, you know, you use your phone this much more, this much less than last week. I typically ignore it. Or, you know, sometimes if it says, you know, an hour or so less, you know, I kind of give myself a pat on the back and say, okay, I've kind of been doing uh, really good this week. And other telehealth uh, platforms that we have. I'll kind of pause here to see if anybody, you know, has any comments about different types of tools that maybe you've seen other people use or do you have the opportunity to use? Could, could you kind of uh, elaborate on that? I mean, uh, the point was for when people are arrested for like suicide or get help and they come in the station. It would have to be perfect. It's not like an AI therapist, but if you put soldiers' information in there, like the, the, the triggers are just like, you know, they change stations, loss of loved ones, gambling, divorce, and all those add up to the, the at risk. Yeah, that's exa exactly it. So it's collecting the data from different places, and then, you know, it's just saying this it's a possibility. It's not saying 100% sure. But yeah, that's a good example. Does it does that data stay personally or is it shared with with anybody else that can respond if needed? You have no, it doesn't uh, so it's an army program, so it doesn't go anywhere. I think you can opt to share it with uh, NHS Genesis if you wish to. Um, but no, I don't it doesn't go to like the local uh, emergency services or that kind of thing. Anybody? 
Anybody else? I use a virtual reality program for EMDR sessions. And if you can buy a bigger fist, that does that. So the, not only is it saving on the cost, but also the virtual reality takes away that need to have that in-person therapy. See somebody else on this side? This is an example of one um, application, uh, Mood Capture. So it looks at your phone if you use facial recognition to unlock your phone. So it compares this over time to, you know, determine if you're depressed when you open your phone. Um, I think you looked at the accuracy rates. It's around 75% right now. So, you know, by no means, you know, it's foolproof. Uh, but, you know, it's a good good guide to just say, you know, if you did use this, you time you unlock your phone, you know, and I'm assuming the more um, you actually use it, the more accurate that it could be. But, you know, some of our facial recognitions are, are different, you know, um, which is hard to determine. Just kind of um, just ask thoughts about what you all think of this good, bad. So, um, if the African person has depression or first treatment, what is the risk of compounding someone's negative appearance of themselves if that continues to happen? Or conversely, if they are depressed, but they had never flagged that because they, you know, because of whatever reason, because of makeup they have on, because of the hat they're wearing, sunglasses. What's the, what do you see as an issue surrounding something like that? Yeah. Good, good, good points. And they kind of, uh, the makers of this, I forget which schools doing the research on this, I want to say Dart Dartmouth did flag that as being, you know, some of, some of the risks they, one of the things that they do is send someone to a questionnaire um, to answer, but it wouldn't pick up if it didn't flag. So that could be a risk to know that if, if I'm feeling depressed and I, it never flags me, and so then what does that tell me? You know, tell me. Right, I'm thinking more of the comments of that. If I open up the app and it tells me that I'm depressed, it has preconditioned me that I'm now depressed. Even if I didn't feel that way, even if I wasn't really self-aware. So then if I get that questionnaire, then I fill out, I'm going to go into this thinking, hey, I'm depressed. This app tells me I'm depressed. Now I'm going to be thinking more like that. So that's what I was talking about, the risk of compounding those things, just based off of uh, interpretation of a facial expression. Yeah. Probably just calibrate. Shared with someone, yeah. Yeah. like should it be shared with a counselor, you know, something that says these are the results that they
more comfortable trusting in yeah. computer. My thing is, what if this is my primary communication with my wife, and I've been in an argument, running argument with her for the last three weeks? My natural thing when I see that is my relationship that's coming there, but it's not a true in, indication of other things going on in the aggregate. Now this thing is telling me you're depressed. Right. Yeah. But, okay, so, okay, so why would that have ever tell the user any of this? Because they change the data against them. That would ruin the entire point of the data capture because you tell them, okay, so now I'm depressed. Okay, so now you just like ruin that data capture. And in fact, the very last person to use this data is a user ever. But, okay, so then that begs the question of where would that data go? And then it is now that, so if I sign up for this app, knowing that I'm not going to know what it is, but that someone else is. I'm going to be like anxious and anticipate that at some point somebody's going to say, "Hey, you got like to be depressed. You got to go talk to the counselor now." So every day you're going to go with that anxiety of knowing that. But I mean, I, I understand what you're saying about taking the data. You know, so you do that. But how do you find that balance? Well, the anxiety in and of itself is useful data. Right, but, but, but it puts the user in a state of anxiety. So are you contributing to putting someone in? adverse mental uh, situations by virtue of having something like this app. If most of you guys would get over a million users, users you can filter that out. Well, for the first million, it's going to be terrible then. Right, the back. If they're not going to got you over here, they I mean, we do, I mean, I'll speak for our, our discipline. We do this every Sunday. We're, we're, we're capturing whatever mood is going on with congregation. And, and, and trying trying to get feedback on how on how to how do we how do we engage them with what we're talking about. And I see a lot much larger application by people putting this in in social or reflective areas where they're reading the mood of what's going on and that can be both good and that can also be very manipulative. And people I mean it's like right out big brother, people trying to say, okay, they're in an agitated state and get them to go do this or message this way. Accepting a flawed program if you do not believe that humans have the discipline to accurately diagnose. And then again, everything you said, I mean, that, that could be easily weaponized. There's, there's a show called Psychopaths where the entire state is, the entire government world is looking for these indicators to see whether your psychopath or your mood is up to standard and then weaponized against the people that are not complying with society. All the while, HIV personalities that are psychopaths or sociopaths to run the world get a free pass because you have to play chess with the population. But anyways, yeah. well, in the army, big army, and at Fort Eisenhower, part of the metrics for the Gabriel Hill going in, you have to sign in and do a numerical data set and I'll be dealing with something like the mystery of the meditation for the Gabriel Hill. Well, yeah, but if, but like all the perfunctory stuff, are you feeling depressed? Are you feeling or anything that hurts so well? I mean, just, I'll be honest here. I do whatever perfunctory thing I need to do to get through the day. Now this thing will upset my apple cart. Like, your mood is not saying what you're checking off the block there. I, I assume a lot of giving you that kind of intrusion in my life. reading about this when there was a training phase of so many images but to your point I mean if that happened to be an extremely happy period in your life when you're going through something during that training phase you know if, if that could be an issue
more kind of, you know, on one side, keeping it private versus, you know, with your sharing it with, you know, a medical profession. You know, I think with a, a lot of these types of tools and technology, that's the big, big question is how much, you know, privacy versus, you know, using the uh, AI um, and how to keep the data uh, private if you want to and maybe, you know, you're allowed to select how much you want to share and what the point. So uh, pardon, well, one of the questions would be what age group is this targeted at? What's the demographics? Um, and then how do we provide any sort of um, whether it's training, any education on things like this to that user prior to this starting? The reason I say that is um, uh, being a parent with uh, almost teenage children, they're extremely impressionable things and if someone makes a comment about them being a certain way or something like that, it can be taken multiple different ways. But then converse to that, uh, like my mother for example, who is older, she is also very hesitant to be uh, vulnerable from a mental health standpoint. So even if, even if she knew that she needed help, she was still like, don't get help. So how do we combat those, those issues that we have? This tool here is marketed for old, you know, adults only, but I mean, I think that's important. It doesn't require training first, um, but I think that would be a good recommendation of there to be some type of training, maybe even if it's, you know, do you have to see someone prior to, you know, implement it? I think right now you can just download it and use it as another tool off of, you know, the app store. Which you know puts you know it's kind of like you know we kind of think about it. If, if your arms hurt a little bit and you go to WebMD, you probably only got you know 30 minutes uh, to to live. Um, yeah, I, I would want my slow go. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the so this is another slide. It looks like it didn't come up. Basically, is there's a lot of sensors that we have even in our phones. You know, and then we can also buy sensors pretty inexpensive, um, wearable, you know, like our Fitbits and those that can collect a lot of data, we can share a lot of data, um, and systems and individuals can make determinations using all that sensors and data that we collect, and is this, you know, it's pros and cons like we've been talking about, you know, privacy versus, you know, helping us, in this case, we're talking about mental health, have an improved mental health state or recognize if we do have uh, issue, you know, something, how much movement, you know, like even if we think about, you know, how many uh, steps um, we're taking, you know, I could, you know, if I'm talking to a counselor of mine, you know, that's probably something that they're going to ask, you know, what type of activity did you do last week? I, I can't say I'm always 100%, you know, uh, true with that, but so if they're actually looking at the data, and, and maybe it's activity one day a week. Normally, you know, it's spread out throughout the week. And what flags are there? You know, and we're combining physical, um, you know, markers that someone or systems can use to make determinations. And get how much do we, to your point, how much do we trust the systems? Uh, so we'll talk about the sensor data. So these are. Um Essentially, person agnostic, it could be from anybody, just whether it's, you know, it's, it's a wearable device, they can collect that sensor data. When we combine that with um, any sort of identification, would they be wrapped up under HIPAA to help protect that data associated with that person? You can use something as simple as their heart rate, their, um, their you know, skin temperature, things like that. Would those be protected? 
they can be, but so sometimes it's interesting. So for instance, like take colleges, for instance, universities, HIPAA data is HIPAA data until, so if your data, for instance, you've got a HIPAA data that causes you to miss a class and you submit that to an instructor, then that becomes a medical uh, educational record instead of a HIPAA record. So some, sometimes it's, it's that kind of uh, fine line that you may start out as HIPAA, um, where does it end up, you know, and then if we're sharing information from, so some of the medical devices, like the wearables, like the Fitbits, if they aren't created as a medical device, um, even though they're measuring heart rate or that, then sometimes that's the question is the hypocrite. Right. I'm looking more from a provider standpoint. seen that, but that would be a good, good way to make sure that it is uh, protected, because that's one of the things. So recently, my mother was in the hospital, and they, she measures her oxygen rate right now. She's got to kind of stay on that and shares that. And so that's what her doctor told her was to put it in the portal versus she was emailing it to him like this is what he And he, took, he did tell her to put it in the portal instead of email, even though you, know, you can't really do a lot with it. Oxygen Right, but as, as devices get, get more compatible and get more um, interested in those sensors, exponentially increase. So just quoting that with a person with a, that has a diagnosis that has a patient record, I think would be important to, to look at the, how to protect the information as it relates to that person. And at what point does it cross over from being simply sensor data to being something that could identify aspects of a person? by a sensor point. This is what I'm going to try to play, but if not, I'll kind of share it out with the slides. This is where we were having the issue with the sound. Now, Dr.
system is able to, in a sense, mathematically and computationally figure out the nature of words and how words associate with each other. So what it does is it draws upon a vast array of data and then it responds to you based on prompts, points out what they need to instruct or ask questions of the system. To do its job, the system must go somewhere to come up with appropriate responses. Systems using what's called rules-based AI are usually closed, meaning programmed to respond only with information stored in their own databases. Then there's generative AI, in which the system can generate original responses based on information from the internet. If you look at ChatGPT, that's a type of generative AI. It's very conversational, very fluent, but it also means that it tends to make it open-ended, that it can say things might not necessarily want to say it's not as predictable, while the rules-based system is very predictable. Robot is a system based on rules that's very controls that way it doesn't say the wrong thing. Robot aims to use AI to bond with users and keep them engaged. Sometimes it can be a little pushy for folks. That's absolutely bizarre, so we have to fit knitting in there to that. Its team of staff psychologists Medical doctors and computer scientists instruct and refine a database of research from medical literature, user experience, and other sources. People that can lead to a, a better conversation. Then writers build questions and answers. The structure, I think, is pretty locked in. And revise them in weekly remote video sessions. Action starts and they're all interrelated. Robots and programmers engineer those conversations into code. Because Wobot is rules-based, it's mostly predictable. But chatbots using generative AI that is scraping the internet are not. Some people sometimes refer to it as AI hallucination. AI can, in a sense, make mistakes or make things up or be fictitious. Sharon Maxwell discovered that last spring after hearing there might be a problem with advice offered by Tessa, a chatbot designed to help prevent eating disorders which, left untreated, can be fatal. Maxwell, who had been in treatment for a eating disorder of her own and advocates for others, challenged the chatbot. So I asked it, how do you help folks with eating disorders? And it told me that it could give folks coping skills. Fantastic. It could give folks resources to find professionals in the eating disorders place. Amazing. But the more she persisted, the more Tessa gave her advice that ran counter to usual guidance for someone with an eating disorder. For example, suggested, among other things, lowering calorie intake and using tools like a skin fold caliber to measure body composition. The general public might look at it and think, that's normal tips, like don't eat as much sugar or eat whole foods, things like that. But to someone with an eating disorder, that's a quick spiral into a lot more disordered behaviors and can be really damaging. Maxwell reported her experience to the National Eating Disorders Association, which had featured Tessa on its website at the time. Shortly after, it took Tessa down. Ellen Fitzsimmons Craig, a psychologist specializing in eating disorders at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, helped lead the team that developed Tessa. That was never the content that our team wrote or programmed into the bot that we deployed. So initially, there was no possibility of something unexpected happening. Correct. Develop something that was the closest to do exactly with this question that would get this answer. Yep. The problem began, she told us, after a healthcare technology company she and her team had partnered with, who named CAS, took over the program. She says CAS explained the harmful messages of the year when people were pushing Tessa's question and answer feature. What's your understanding of what went wrong? My understanding of what went wrong is that at some point, and we really have to talk to CAS about this, but that there may have been generative AI features that were built into their platform. And so my best estimation is that these features were added into this program as well. CAS did not respond to multiple requests for comment. Does your negative experience kind of pause it right there? It kind of goes on. But, but that was one of the things that I kind of wanted to get to the point of sharing that, like, even though the developers developed it with these safeguards in place down the line, and, you know, we kind of think
think about you know how many software platforms or companies even get involved years down the line, whether it's five years, or twenty years, or fifty years, and it can change the intent of uh, what's there. So, uh, anybody have comments here? Okay, so that report seems a little biased because we don't know how much they actually push that AI at all. We have no clue that if a, if a computer is there specifically that's proposed, no doubt. I would say it seemed like, you know, just from even her comments that, you know, she was looking to, you know, uh, right. So we, it's I mean, a human, if it's a human, you would then put it on how to sue that person. You know, I mean, if AI is coming out with information, and you know, everybody is going to think about who the human is, there's a lot of companies, they might have done this, and there's something in terms of everybody's writing a code. You don't know what the fuck 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 To your point, to where it could be somebody that's just questioning. We have no idea her motives at all. And then the other point they make in here is to your comments earlier about the coding. You know, who's doing the coding? How are the biases uh, introduced? Who's the software tested on? Like, even when you talk about, um, like, the jump the bridge, you know, like what are these nuances and conversations that, you know, certain cultures might say something, um, yeah, and if it's not picked up, then it's not going to flag it. So like if this, you know, slang isn't determined in the software, it's not going not to pick it up. And so we've kind of been talking about most, most of these uh, risks to, to using AI with mental health. You know, so I think we've seen these. Um, big one is, you know, especially with generative AI, if you're using data that's out there already, you know, what's the biases that are already in the data if we're searching through the internet or we're looking at medical data, um, you know, if we're comparing diagnoses um, that we've had in our organization, if we're a you know, mental health uh, organization and we're saying, Okay, these are flagged, have been flagged as uh, diagnoses. Did our real life counselors have certain biases that we see in the data? And so then if the software looks at the existing data that we have, it's gonna, you know, probably get close to the same biases as there. Who's creating, testing the rules, you know, um, that's that's your point, you know, one of the important things when we talk about having um, diverse
testing populations, diverse uh, sets of coders to limit that. Um, addictions, um, I just read this one article, I didn't put it in here, but that they're seeing people become addicted to um, generative AI, like ChatGPT, for relationships. So like someone will have a relationship with ChatGPT, that that'll be their boyfriend or their girlfriend, um, that they're used to talking to that person, and now that they're putting these voices that you can subscribe to a different voice, and so people are becoming addicted to certain types of AI. You know, it sound, sounds crazy, but that's the world we're, the world we're in. Uh, errors that are out there, especially with generative AI, it's, it's not perfect. Like, even if you play around with it and ask it questions, you know, there'll be things that it comes back with that's, that's not accurate. And so, of us having to ask those questions, um, the unhealthy relationship, you know, just making sure that, you know, we're recognizing that this is a technology tool and it's not really a person on the other end, even if we're having a conver conversation with, um, that we don't get into the habit of this is a person. Um, so, I have a question more on the, the interpretation of the input. So if you're typing something in, um, we're talking about errors. This is errors coming out, or this is errors going in, like autocorrect, something like that. Or what cause being put towards, most of us as we speak, we speak in complete sentences using full words. However, we type, we type in shorthand using acronyms. I was thinking of was errors coming out, but to your point of us putting information in in a different format than we would share with someone that's sitting here in, in front of us. Yeah. Oh, right. Because you mentioned this is geared more towards adults. Uh, I would assume that would be somewhere in the 25 or 45 area. Uh, and most people at that age, like I said, type in a particular way. Whereas the generation that's coming up does not. kind of go together that you kind of should be saying it in yeah. this this it's like in the car hey if you have many different cars if you have some type of guy you're hitting on the apps you might think about other biases that we haven't uh, covered so far or risk limitations built in.
And I think that's what makes generative AI, you know, such an effective tool of realizing, you know, how can we manage those risks so that we can keep, keep growing and take advantage of change and we just aren't stuck in one point of, you know, time unless somebody is manually updating, you know, the model that, that we're using. slides in just there's a lot of different tools out there and they kind of range from you know these um, you know relaxation meditation type tools and we should probably see the calm advertising it seems like it comes on every other uh, every other uh, segment uh, there so um, I'm sure as much as they're paying for advertisement I have not price the actual ad with how much much it is I'm sure it's uh, not free um, then for anxiety Depression, and several different apps that are out there, and then also I think someone mentioned the um, next one, the uh, sleep app um, there. Um, that, that was there. So it's just you know all these technologies we continue to use of make improvements. The main thing to listen those is there's not one vendor that's doing it. There's you know several different vendors, and pros and cons to all. Um, That brings us kind of right to uh, time. If anybody wants to add anything um, here for next few minutes, we don't get kicked out. Uh, so we've got any. <laughs> okay. I'll be here for this. So if you want to scan and get that taken care of for Everybody for your feedback. I've got a whole page of notes. <laughs> <laughs> it's surprising enough, it's, it, 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 it is a thing. Yeah, that, that people, yeah, that people are having these full relationships with oh the computer. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's, it's just, I'm with you. It's, it's hard to believe, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing, you know, trying to get this to work. 
Understands the usage of that word better than the speaker does. Far better than the speaker does because it's a language. In, in theory, yes, mm -hmm. but I mean, there are. 